It's a well-known experimental fact that clocks closer to a body of mass will tick more slowly than those farther out. A phenomenon known as gravitational time dilation. But what actually determines the precise rates of such ticking? That is, what causes this time dilation? Well, to know that, modern physics requires that you know the actual amount by which a body of mass warps space and time in its vicinity. This in turn requires solving one of the most difficult and advanced mathematical expressions known to man. The formidable Einstein equation. But what if there were a simpler route, one that could get you the exact same answers and even deeper insights without requiring years of mathematical study. This is Dialect with The True Cause of Gravitational Time Dilation. If you're familiar with relativity, you may have come across this particular solution to the Einstein equation before, called the Schwarzschild solution. This expression, corresponding to the Schwarzschild space-time metric, is pretty lengthy and intimidating. But for the moment, all we care about is this particular factor in front of the cdt squared infinitesimal. Which, when we take its square root, gives us the precise rate by which clocks in a gravitational field will tick more slowly. That is, this expression tells us that a clock situated at a distance r out from a central mass will tick more slowly than a clock very far out in deep space by a factor of the square root of 1 minus 2 gm over c squared times r. Here g is the gravitational constant, c the speed of light, and m the mass of the body, which is assumed to be uncharged and negligibly rotating. As an example, if we consider a clock on the surface of the Earth, then, after plugging in all the respective values, this expression tells us that our clock runs 0.7 nanoseconds slower than it would if it were out in deep space. Obviously, the effect of gravitational time dilation is very slight in most cases. Indeed, if we wanted our Earth clocks to run, say, half as fast as deep space ones, then we'd have to increase the mass of the Earth by 540 million times its original amount. Or, should we instead keep Earth's mass constant, we'd have to shrink its radius down to 1.18 centimeters, about the size of a grape, to achieve the same level of time dilation. Shrink it down a little further, and you'd hit the Schwarzschild radius corresponding to the mass of the Earth. But we'll circle back to that. So, where does this expression actually come from? Well, modern physics would claim there's only one route to it. That being through Einstein's famous field equation, relating the curvature of space-time to its momentum energy density. Now, it took Einstein nearly a decade to formulate this equation. And even after that, the math was still so difficult he was unable to solve it himself. Indeed, the simplest solution, the Schwarzschild solution, requires numerous complicated assumptions before it even gets off the ground. And then it's pages and pages of dizzying calculations until the metric is arrived at. So it may seem then that an understanding of where gravitational time dilation comes from is hopelessly out of reach to the ordinary layperson. Well, don't give up hope just yet because this expression can be derived in about five minutes without any reference to Einstein's equation, using rather just basic high school math and some solid physical intuition. But how is this possible? Well, good science hinges on a good hypothesis, and the hypothesis we're going to make here regards the cause of gravitational time dilation. That is, we will assert that gravitational time dilation is caused by the exact same thing which causes regular, i.e. relativistic, time dilation. Now, flashing back to special relativity for a minute, the cause of relativistic time dilation is quite simple. 
When a clock is set into motion, the light signals traversing it have a farther distance to travel to reach their destination. Consequently, the clock's ticking is slowed. For a clock moving at some constant velocity v, the degree of this dilation can be calculated via the basic Pythagorean theorem and takes the form of the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. Now, right away, we can notice something extremely curious. The expression for gravitational time dilation and relativistic time dilation have very similar forms. Both have a square root with a 1 minus beneath it, as well as a c squared in the denominator of the subtracted term. This similarity in structure now motivates us to make a sudden but intriguing conceptual leap. What if we interpreted the remaining quantity in the gravitational expression as being equal to some velocity squared? If we do this, then we could claim that, just as a clock in special relativity ticks more slowly because it is traveling at some particular velocity v through space, a clock in a gravitational field will also tick more slowly because it is traveling at a particular velocity through space, a velocity equal to the square root of 2gm over r. At first glance, this might sound absurd. Clocks in a gravitational field clearly aren't in motion. They're stationary. But this isn't quite true, because in order to remain at a stationary distance from a gravitational mass, these clocks must all be continually combating the pull of gravity, meaning they must be accelerating. Down near the surface of the mass, this acceleration would have to be fairly substantial, since the gravitational pull there is correspondingly strong. As we move farther away from the mass, the gravitational pull falls off, and the required acceleration falls off with it. Eventually, when we reach very great distances, there is negligible gravitational pull and our clocks would not be required to accelerate at all. Okay, so our clocks are accelerating, but they still clearly have no velocity, right? Well, they have zero velocity with respect to the central mass, but that doesn't mean they couldn't have velocity with respect to something else. Indeed, here is where we make note of another extremely intriguing coincidence. The expression the square root of 2gm over r, our hypothetical guess for the velocity of these accelerating clocks, isn't just some random assemblage of values. It's actually already a well-known velocity expression that, incredibly enough, comes from classical Newtonian physics. As it happens, this velocity expression corresponds to what's called escape velocity. The velocity at which you'd have to outwardly launch an object in order for it to completely escape the gravitational pull of a given body of mass. Now this is very strange. Escape velocity is derived from the classical expression for gravitational force. So, what is it doing lodged in the heart of a fully relativistic solution to Einstein's equation? General relativity doesn't really offer an answer to that question. Indeed, this fact, if it even ever receives mention at all, is considered to be a coincidence within the context of modern physics. But of course, good science doesn't rely on coincidence. And so, we ought to ask, just what then is the connection here? Well, digging a little deeper, one can find that, in addition to escape velocity, there's a second physical meaning to the expression the square root of 2gm over r, something one might term capture velocity. This is essentially escape velocity, but in reverse, the velocity acquired by an object released at a very great distance from a mass. Now this provides the final clue to the puzzle. For, imagine a steady stream of tiny neutral particles being released a very far distance away from your central mass. As gravity captures and accelerates these particles inwards, they pick up speed, giving rise to a steady flow field about the mass. The speed of this flow, at any distance r out, 
becomes precisely the capture velocity value, the square root of 2gm over r. So, if we want to extend our hypothesis that relativistic time dilation and gravitational time dilation are one and the same thing, then we can do so by asserting that our clocks have a velocity v with respect to this particular flow field, a velocity which they maintain via their constant outward acceleration with respect to the mass. Now, of course, there aren't really fields of particles flowing into gravitational masses. So this leaves us with the all-important question. Just what is flowing here? Well, the answer to that question is space. Space is what is flowing. But not some abstract coordinative space. Rather, the physical space through which light and other causal information propagates as a wave. For this is precisely what the equivalence of relativistic and gravitational time dilation implies. Clocks tick more slowly when moving faster with respect to such space. Hence, clocks which are ticking more slowly lower down in a gravitational field must be moving faster through this space than those higher up. Ergo, the entirety of space surrounding a mass must be steadily flowing inwards carrying objects, matter, and even light along with the current of its flow. Gravity can then be supposed to be a force acting not on traditional matter, but rather on this space itself, accelerating it inwards at the traditional Newtonian gravitational rate, gm over r squared. This ontological conception of gravity is known as flowing space, or the river model. And, surprisingly, it's not at all new. In fact, its roots extend as far back as Isaac Newton, who first tentatively proposed the idea in a private letter to a colleague. Now, regardless of how it strikes your fancy, it should be apparent just how easily this model allows us to derive gravitational time dilation. For all that we need to posit is that space, very far out from a mass, is slowly captured by gravity and accelerated inwards at the traditional Newtonian rate. Then a little high school calculus shows that this space eventually acquires a speed of the square root of 2gm over r with respect to the mass as it flows radially in. Clocks stationary with respect to this mass are therefore traveling through space at this velocity, and hence their dilation amount can be calculated using the normal relativistic factor. Now, hindsight is always 2020, but let's stop and take a moment to marvel at the incredible fact that it took Einstein and others 10 years to derive an expression that they might have discovered far more swiftly if they'd simply chosen to favor physical intuition over mathematical abstraction. Indeed, notice how we didn't utilize any complicated mathematics to get to our answer. No differential geometry, no four vectors, no tensors and best of all, absolutely no space-time curvature. Such a derivation shouldn't even be possible according to modern physics. Yet here it is, completed with nothing further than basic physical principles Newton himself might have advocated for. Now, as we've discussed in a prior video, the river model offers a number of other powerful insights into general relativity, which are not accessible via the standard geometric interpretation. Insights such as the meaning of the equivalence principle, or the nature of tidal forces. But most notably, this model tells us that the infamous Schwarzschild radius of a black hole simply corresponds to setting our capture velocity equal to the speed of light implying that the event horizon of a black hole is nothing more than a place where space is flowing inwards towards a mass at the speed of light c. Light and other causal signals are thereby constrained by this horizon, unable to swim upstream fast enough to escape the current of space there. Meanwhile, clocks accelerating in place near this horizon will tick so slowly as to appear to be frozen. But does all this mean space is really flowing into large bodies of mass? If so, why? 
Where does this space come from? And where does it go? What other properties might it have? Those are all important questions to explore, but none are as important as asking whether or not this model can account for the other major predictions of general relativity. The bending of light, the precession of Mercury's perihelion, and the completer nature of black holes. Well, the answer to that is yes, yes it can. And it can do so all without any reference to space-time curvature. Meaning, we're in some brand new ontological territory. Indeed, in future videos we'll be showing that this model offers us not only heightened conceptual clarity and greater mathematical simplicity over geometric general relativity, but also that it incorporates causal mechanisms for its phenomena in a way which general relativity cannot, hence opening pathways to deeper and newer theories. Indeed, it's clear that modern physics is about to hit a major turning point, that the old ways of abstract mathematical thinking aren't going to suffice for much longer. And it's for this very reason that we've called together a conference for physical and mathematical ontology to take place in a few weeks in Munich, Germany. There we're bringing together a number of astute independent thinkers in order to start sincerely probing the deeper nature of our physical reality. And while mainstream physics isn't likely to part with its cherished abstractions anytime soon, you'll find these and other thinkers exploring a variety of new and alternative approaches to modern physics. So check back soon to see what interesting revelations may be in store. And as always, this has been Dialect. Thanks for watching.